Good morning, everyone. My name is Casey Grant, Executive Director of the Fire Protection Research Foundation, the research affiliate for NFPA. Uh, I want to welcome you here to this uh, presentation at the Responder Forum. Uh, and I'm not only welcoming all of you here in the room today, but also a virtual room uh, that's approximately 10 times this size. Uh, so we want to say uh, hello to everyone and, uh, and really try to open up our minds in this presentation that you're about to hear on the future uh, firefighting uh, activities that we're all looking at and, and the firefighter of the future. So um, I really want you to just step back for a moment some of this, some of you have heard before. Uh, some of you have not heard any of it. Uh, but I want to get us on the same page. And as you prepare for your breakout groups here at the Responder Forum, uh, you really need to open up your minds. You need to think uh, where we're going. And I want to say, you know, you've heard it a couple times already this morning. Uh, you know, Ken had mentioned what's in it for me, but also what's in it for we. Uh, you need to think about where we're going with all this smart technology, all this data, data analytics. What is it going to do for us as we go forward? The potential is enormous. Uh, and I'll also tell you, you're going to hear a number of themes woven throughout all this. Status quo is not an option. If you think in terms of status quo, you will be left behind. The world is indeed changing. And we'll talk specifically about that. Um, so, so be very open-minded as we go through this material. I'm going to give you some, some basics, some building blocks. Uh, but this is really about you. And you're going to hear uh, several other themes in terms of, um, in fact, our, the speaker that's following me. Uh, you'll hear some great innovation uh, activities. But what's so important is the voice of the stakeholder, you. You know, you, th there's a lot of great people doing great things out there. But they need this direction, this guidance, this input from you and, and us collectively, back to what's in it for me and what's in it for we. So keep that in mind as we go through. Now, I get accused of a lot of things, uh, but I do want to say one of the better things is I get accused of being a visionary sometimes. Well, I have to say, you know, I do have a vision, and it's a vision uh, of tomorrow, but tomorrow is happening now. It's really happening. I'm very optimistic on where we're heading. There's great things on the horizon. So with that, let's go through this presentation, the firefighter of the future here at the Responder Forum. And um, I'm going to cover this information based on our three days here together. Today, day one, uh, you're going to hear additional presentations and go to breakout groups. And we're going to be more technology oriented. And after I give some background on the building blocks of where we are with all this smart stuff, uh, I'm going to um, lay that out. But I'm going to then talk about this data, 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 data. And we're going to just cover that. But that's actually in preparation for tomorrow and the breakout groups for tomorrow. But then I want to wrap up with some very specific examples, build upon the three presentations that you already heard from this morning about the work from last year, the excellent work. Uh, but this third and fourth uh, block of information, relatively brief, um, only six slides involved with those two sections. Uh, but I do want to, again, get you thinking. You know, this is in preparation for where you're going with your breakout groups and so forth. So with that, I want to talk about some of these building blocks uh, and where we're heading and trying to look into the crystal ball and what all this means. Now, there's this uh, interesting a pyramid that's used in Computer Science 101 uh, called the DIKY Pyramid, which stands for Data, Information, Knowledge, and Wisdom. And I'll, I'll go back and I'll, I'll quote Sean from earlier who said, information is gold. Oh boy, yes it is, absolutely. But actually, as we look at this data pyramid, that's a piece of it. And um, you know, how does this all fit together and what does it mean? I'm going to come back and I'm going to use this uh, a DIKY pyramid a number of times with specific examples that you can see uh, that help portray what it is we're trying to do here. So, uh, and with that, again, as our backdrop, you see the red outline, um, technology, that's how we get it done, the hardware, the software, the communications, and so forth. But then we have that lifeblood of the data and the data analytics that we use to refine that data. So let's talk more specifically about that. So that's a key concept that I want you to hold in your hip pocket. Now, I want to give you another key concept here. 
you know, it was approximately three to four years ago when I started down this path with the NIST project to develop the research roadmap for smart firefighting that I first heard about cyber physical systems. It's like, well, what is that? And that's this blending of the world of cyber and the world of physical. And you're hearing other terms very common today, the internet of things, the internet of everything. Um, this all comes to play in this world of cyber physical systems. And at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, with whom we worked on that project, uh, we were in a collaborative agreement with them, they have cyber physicists, they have departments of people that are working on this. And uh, so there's a lot of folks doing uh, this activity. Now, here's the key thing I want as a takeaway of this building block. Their world is incredibly straightforward. After I you know, found my way into their world and was sort of sifting through things, and I realized, well, wait a minute, you know, they divide the world into these three basic pieces. So I just cannot emphasize this enough. As you're going through everything you're gonna do and all this smart stuff and what it can do for us and make our world a better place, the world of firefighting and so forth, it comes down to these three primary blocks of information. Gathering the data, i.e. communications and so forth, sensors, you name it, processing the data, doing something with it, sometimes straightforward in comparisons, uh, dashboards, sometimes uh, it, it very extensive fire modeling or something very complex, uh, but it's everything that you're doing with the data. Somehow you're doing analytics, you're doing something with it. And then finally, delivering the data back to whoever needs it. Probably the greatest underappreciated part of this three-part spectrum is delivering that data back to the people who need it. Not this, not opening the floodgates and then they're just overwhelmed with all this stuff and it's like, what do I do with it? No, it's giving the person exactly what they need, when they need it, the way they need it, and nothing more. It's delivering that data. You know, if you're the fighter pilot, you do not want to be overloaded with stuff at a critical moment. You want exactly what you need and nothing more. That's, kind of, that's hard for us to do. So of these, and I'll tell you right now, we live in a sensor-rich world. That first one is perhaps the most straightforward, and the third is perhaps the most challenging. So keep this in mind, and again, we use this word smart. It's, it's arguably overused, and it's an acronym. Uh, and I you know, show one example of that acronym here, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely. But the bottom line is it's all this stuff coming back information, knowledge, wisdom, making our world a better place through data. So keep that all in mind. Now I wanna give you this other sort of background thought here. Now, and I don't know, Ken, if you use this slide as well because uh, Paul had used it. It's a very popular illustration, this picture of the papal elections. And you can see the difference from 2005 to 2013. So what's going on with these things here, okay? Now my message of this slide is don't tell me the world's not changing. Don't tell me that status quo is not an option because the world is gonna leave you behind if you believe that. It, you know, if you have your head stuck in the sand, the world is changing. So what are these things? You know, I, you know, I carry this around because it gives me access to incredible amounts of information. You know, entire encyclopedias and, and more. Data sets that are unimaginable, I can pull up at just a few keystrokes now, incredible. I have to say, you know, I don't go anywhere without this, even though I'm using it up here as a prop. I was actually in a hotel lobby at one point that had an armed robbery, and there I was crawling around in the carpet in the corner, in the lounge area, you know. It's the one time I was glad that CNN was blaring away, listening, but this guy was robbing the, you know, the front desk, and I'm calling 911, well, I found this to be incredibly valuable, okay? I don't go anywhere without it anymore. But it's, it's, it's really a portal into another universe, really. You know, figuratively and literally. So this has changed our world. You know, if, what, seven, eight years ago, this just came onto the marketplace and was mass produced. This is, you know, very new. So, you know, we look at where we are in the fire service um, and we can clearly see that, you know, there's other sectors that are doing a lot. You know, the defense, the military folks, we often are looking at what they're doing. Healthcare, manufacturing, 
transportation. You know, there's all these sectors out there and they're all doing great stuff. But when you come back to the fire service and other emergency responders, those cyber physical systems people who we got involved with at NIST and elsewhere started saying, whoa, you fire service people, you're a little different from transportation and manufacturing these other sectors. You know, you're dealing with a lot of the same issues, but two big differences. First of all, a lot of what you do, people may live or die according to what happens. Really critical stuff. They, they fully appreciated that. The other thing, though, was really interesting. They came and they said, what data is important to you people? Everything. Everything. Unlike, you know, other sectors, transportation or manufacturing, whatever, which can silo into their areas and say, yeah, we don't need that, we don't need that. When you talk about emergencies, what data can come into play? Everything. Well, the, the cyber physical systems people, they picked up on that and they said, oh, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> there's nothing off the table. One of my favorite examples is in uh, a lot of the Asian uh, cultures and countries, they have smart chopsticks. It's like, what are those? Well, it actually can detect the quality of the oil that's used because there's a real problem with bad oil. Well, you go on an EMS call, we want that data. Virtually all data, okay? Nothing's off the table. So just keep that in mind. So um, I wanna jump back now, and actually this is something that's in my uh, notes in the uh, slide presentation for the people who are watching online. I think they have access to that, assuming it's the PowerPoint and not the PDF. Uh, but either way, we can provide it later if they don't, and if you don't. But I have in my notes, I want to go through this DAKY pyramid again and give you some specific examples. But here's, here's what this is all about. So on the backbone of technology with hardware, software, communications, you name it, everything that we need to do to make it work and happen, then we can harvest this data. So, but data in its simplest form what do we do with it? It's very simple when you really distill it down. But if we give it context, it yields information. So that's the I, you got data D, information I. From the information, we can give it meaning and it, and it yields knowledge. And then from that knowledge, the K, we give it insight and we can take action and we have wisdom. And with that, we can control our destiny. So, you know, you said, Sean, information is gold. Absolutely. You can control your destiny. You can control the outcome of situations. And some of these, you know, real time, they're very serious situations. Again, people can live and die. So this is the kind of thing we come back to. So let's go through some examples here of how we hopefully can control our, our destiny. I want to look at my notes because these are on the note pages in the PowerPoint. But let's go through this computer science 101 example of a red light, traffic light. So the color red, that's actually digitally represented in data. RGB of 255.1.1 in code speak, computer code speak. And uh, so it's got, you know, that's the data. But what do we do with that? So we give that meaning. In, in the context of uh, the meaning of that would be the east traffic light at first and D Street has changed to the color red. Okay, so now, now I'm a, you know, something's happening. There's, there's a, you know, I've given it a, a, a geocoding, a place, a location, but now comes in knowledge, the context of it. That's the traffic light I'm approaching as I'm driving down the road. Oh, okay, it's red in front of me. Now I know this is a simple example, but that's the point. So then I have wisdom, what do I do? I stop. Or if I'm fire apparatus, I slow down, proceed with caution or whatever it is, but I take an action. I control my destiny over that simple data of the color red. Okay, so that's the simple example. Let's go through a couple of other examples here. Firefighter needs help. So there's a mayday situation. Okay, this is, this is quite different. So in this case, in a structural fire where rapid intervention is needed of some kind. So the data is a mayday signal. Could be a pass device, audible, or let's be hypothetical and say it's a GPS locator. Something yet forthcoming, but again, there's great groups out there pushing hard 
with innovation to make this a reality at some point. So we're looking forward to those GPS locators, but so we're getting a signal back. So that's our data. What does that mean to us? It means somebody needs assistance. Somebody needs assistance now. That's what that means. So let's give that context and bring it to the knowledge level of our pyramid. Immediate intervention is needed based on the fire conditions and the firefighter location. And from that, we take action. Our wisdom, send the RIT in, side B, second floor hallway, that's the location now, okay? So we take that data and we do something with it. Let's go through some other examples. And I'm gonna give you a portfolio of different examples here that are meant to prove what we're talking about in the value of data. So here we have a wildland urban interface event, including evacuation. And I think of the Fort McMurray event recently because I'll talk about it later with some of the social media issues and so forth. But that's a great example. There's you know, plenty to refer to here. So in this case, we have the data being the weather and the wind direction. Okay, we know what the wind direction is. We're watching that closely. However, the information and the meaning that we have is it's shifted. It's not coming the same way. All of a sudden, it's coming a different direction. So the knowledge then, putting it in context, where do we go with that? The fire is gonna change direction and we have possible entrapment issues. What is our wisdom? Evacuate immediately to the southeast. You take action based on that data, information, and knowledge, putting it all into context and taking action. You know, and I, I'm a hiker. I love to go out there and, and I can tell you, you know, as I'm running around on the, on the hillside in the daylight without smoke and so forth, it's often hard to know where you are. I know we have technology that can assist us and we want to implement that for the fire service, for wildland, wooey, and so forth, as well as other applications. We want that. Incident command. You heard a little bit of this this morning. So in this case, let's go back and we talked about uh, aerial robotics, drones this morning. So in this case, let's for us as the incident commander. So that's our data coming back. So from that, let's give that meaning. Oh, our visual observation is indicating, hey, that's actually spreading first floor to second floor. We're seeing fire spread um, on this side C. So we put this in the context now with our knowledge, the fire's spreading beyond the resources we have available on the fire ground. What's our wisdom as incident commander? We're calling for reinforcements, striking another alarm. So we're taking that information. A lot of this we, you know, is a bit cookie cutter and you know what's going on, but it's applying this in ways that we can make use of this data, this information, this knowledge. And back to that information is gold. It is. All right, let me give you a simple example of a hose nozzle. And there's a reason I wanted to throw this here into the mix, this one. Um, but let's just say, uh, so you're, you're a firefighter and, and you're finding out you've got inadequate hose line performance. That's your data, the visual observation. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting enough water here, okay? So, so the meaning of that is the water is not reaching the seat of the fire. It's not being effective, okay? So let's give that context. I need more pressure, okay? So let's give the wisdom to that, to control our destiny. You call for more pressure from the pump operator. Very straightforward and simple. Now, I threw this one in here because as I've been working with these cyber physical systems people, these computer science people, I love these people. And I, you know, it's especially informative, these people who don't know anything about the fire service, but they're very smart at what they do. But they ask these simple questions like, really? You got a call back on a radio? You mean you're not automatically transmitting the, the necessary variables and parameters so that the hose line just adjusts the volume pressure automatically? Why aren't you doing that? That's the question that <laughs> comes back to me. And I was like, you know, that's a good idea. We really should be doing that. So I had to throw this one in here because it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, we do what we need to do to get it done, the five monkeys. But we don't need to. And you know, we're looking at these organizations out there, large and small, 
that are really doing wonderful things, and we want to harvest that, the, everything that they're doing for our benefit. And they need our voice. They need that guidance. They need to know what do we need to do to make this work and work right. Okay, so let's go to another example here, vehicle extrication. And with vehicle extrication, so, so this is interesting because I can tell you, for those of us, as a number of you here, we've worked on the electric vehicles, and, and uh, these vehicles are rich with information. And we did a workshop this summer, and we sort of had this moment where we realized, you know, we've gone through, uh, you know, trying to badge the vehicles, and so you could clearly know on arrival, is this an electric vehicle, or is it LP, you know, what's going on? What do we have for a hazard? We just want to know the hazard. So then we realized, well, wait a minute, we're doing nothing to harvest the telematics. And we want to do that. So we want to work with the automakers, and they're willing to work with us, and we need to do this to harvest that information electronically, you know, as we are pulling up on the scene. So here, the data being uh, telematics, that's what they call it, by the way, telematics. And by the way, this is, you know, there's a lot of groups out there doing it, like OnStar, and, um, and I can tell you even um, the black box information, there's groups like Progressive Insurance, they are getting you to harvest that information and data in your black box in your vehicle by giving you a flash drive and you voluntarily are submitting it back to them so they can lower your insurance rates. Oh, that's, so that's all good. Okay, but, so you know, it's always a question if it's like somebody else is gonna use it or what's happening with that data. This is another issue we're gonna talk about in a few, few moments. But anyway, so the vehicle is transmitting back the data. And it's, you know, it's telling us what's involved. And in this case, we give it meaning. And, and by the way, this was a real um, example in Connecticut, an electric vehicle. And I can tell you the person came out um, uh, okay in this, despite the, you know, the difficulty of the uh, extrication. Um, but in here, you know, the vehicle's an electric vehicle, and it's got a fully charged large format battery. Oh, okay. So our context, our knowledge of that, is we've got to do extrication and we've got to do this so that we can avoid the potential shock hazard and compromising the battery pack and so forth. Okay, so then we apply the wisdom to that and we do specific workarounds with the extrication process to make sure that you know, we avoid the shock potential and so forth as we get that person out of there. So this is a, yet another example and it's a non-fire example. I mean, these go to any and everything we do. So let's, um, let me just give a couple of other examples here, but on the prevention side, the pre-event side, it's not just during the event, it's before the event, during the event, and after the event. It's all of that, it's all important. So here, prevention and enforcement, and we heard this uh, with the data presentation earlier, you know, there's algorithms, there's all kinds of risk factors that are now being taken into consideration. So I throw one out here as an example. There's a noise complaint data on a college campus. And we've learned by doing this a long time and having algorithms and so forth, we give that meaning by saying noise complaint data is usually high in certain residential areas. We give it context, uh, knowledge. Noise complaints match somewhat well the incidence of fire and fire risk, higher risk. Okay, what's our wisdom? What action are we going to take? We're going to go inspect those places. So, you know, we have preemptive uh, inspections. Okay, so that's a, that's a very clear example of, um, of the preventative side. Let me go to the post-event side, post-event. So, in investigations, you know, the sky is the limit here. You know, we talk about the digital dust and, you know, what all this leaves. It's incredible, the, uh, the digital footprint that's left behind. Um, electronically and with data and so forth. But here, you know, here's just a very simple, um, straightforward example. Uh, door is damaged after the fire. We can clearly see that. It's just a visual observation, straightforward. Um, the specific meaning, well, we see a specific burn pattern here, um, you know, indicating a, a, a flow path. So we apply that in context and we can see that how the flow path was going and it gives us the wisdom to realize when that door was opened, arguably, during the event, and, and matching that with the other data the investigators are using to make their decision. But I have to say, you know, back to the digital footprints, um, there is just so much data uh, in terms of background on any location and so forth, 
that it's almost a you know, question of how we harvest that information. So let me wrap up with these last two here of these, this uh, set of examples, fire ground contamination. And personally, this is a topic that I've been spending a lot of time on lately with some of our other research projects at the Research Foundation. But fire ground contamination, let me just say, okay, hypothetically you have a situation, there's a basement fire, and then you find out that basement fire is actually a basement transformer. Oh, this is an older building. Uh-oh, we find out there's PCBs in this transformer. Okay, so what does that mean? So in terms of field addressing this issue or field decon, so what would we do differently? Well, so we're seeing from building permits, our data is that the building permits indicate we had PCBs and a transformer that were involved in a fire in this building. Well, what does that mean? Give it, you know, what's the information here that we're looking for? Well, the fire's contam uh, chemical contaminants from those PCBs may be on the gear we may have been exposed. So the knowledge, the context, is my gear may be contaminated with PCBs. I want to know that. Don't tell me the data is not important. I want to know that. So what's the wisdom here? Well, let's go through whatever the special field decon is that we should go through to get this stuff off of us as soon as we can, okay? We want to use this data. Now, I want to go to this last example because you know, it's actually, let's use the same scenario. A basement fire, a basement fire with the transformer involving PCBs. But this is where I want you to be thinking. It's not only about what's in it for me, it's what's in it for we. You know, this is the long-term collection of data. We need this data. Now, you need this data. There's a personal side as we talk about exposure tracking and so forth. So here's an example that I'm just gonna wrap this up with this little section. So our data, again, is that the building permits indicate the basement fire had a transformer with PCBs. Our information is that this fire included PCB chemical contaminants in the smoke. Our knowledge, the context that we're putting this into, I experienced a fire and exposure to PCBs. Okay, the level of that exposure is, you know, there's lots of questions to that, but I was at that fire, okay. So where is the wisdom applied to this in the long term now, as we talk about exposure tracking and so forth? I want to know my personal diary of activities that I went to as a firefighter and what I was exposed to over the course of my career so that at the end of the day, if I'm having a medical problem, we can trace it back and figure out, ah, you know, this background. So this is, a, you know, you've heard a lot of activity on exposure tracker, you know, I'm working on a 30-year, uh, cancer cohort study with a number of the universities and there's activities in terms of trying to clarify how we're tracking these exposures and the parameters that should be used. So this is, these are examples of, of using the DIKY pyramid uh, to help us uh, with um, all that we do and more. There's, there's no limit to all this. So I now want to shift gears and I just want to talk about somewhat briefly, the research roadmap, because this has been huge for us, not only in terms of getting the word out, trying to work with the stakeholder community, the entire fire service, all emergency responders, but further opening doors into arenas we've never been in before, with computer science people, people you know, who are based in Palo Alto, California, and elsewhere. Uh, it, this has been an enormous door opener. And I know a couple of you, for instance, were at our Smart Home Summit that we held in Palo Alto. Well, it was important for us to hold it there. Uh, this was a year ago, uh, so that we could really enable and get linkage with some of these other groups, and it's been great. So this roadmap, and it's, is, it's done you know, more on the researcher side on what we need to do, but that's available at this URL, so anybody can just go download a copy and um, it's also on the NIST site. It was a, a, a co-authored uh, document with uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology with the Department of Commerce, and they provided the funding, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, but the scope of this activity, it addresses everything the fire service does, not just fighting a structural fire, but everything. Fighting wildland fire, wooey event, uh, technical rescue, non-fire events, whether they're EMS, elevator rescue, you name it. Everything the fire service does, pre-event, during the event, 
post-event. Now I've got to say, there's a huge difference pre-event and post-event, you have a lot more time. Real-time processing is not as critical as it is during the event. So, you know, these are important parameters that we take into account uh, with the scope of this project. I don't want to get into the details of this. This is the primary, single, most important output from the report uh, in the final chapter. And I will tell you that as we bucketed and grouped the key things that we came up with, they fell into these four primary buckets. Standardization, developmental gaps, the broad conceptual gaps, and finally, solution approaches. Now, the first three are almost self-explanatory. That fourth one, though, uh, solution approaches, and this is a theme that I want to touch on a couple times, um, and I will as we continue to go forward through these other slides. Solution approaches, we realize there's so many groups out there, large and small, small entrepreneurs in some case, uh, that are doing incredible stuff. It's dazzling. Well, we want that. We don't need to invent anything. There are groups out there that are doing it, and they're doing a wonderful job. But there's a parade going down the street, and we need to get in the parade and help guide where it's going. You know, the voice of the stakeholder, your voice, is so important in this. But we don't need to invent a thing. So solution approaches, what we were talking about here, are, for instance, a data X prize or you know, proof of concept type research projects. One of my favorites is the DARPA Robotics Challenge held annually. I, today, thousands of people go to these, uh, the robotics uh, challenges that DARPA has. D DARPA is the Defense Acquisition Research uh, Program Group, and, um, and it's incredible what they've been able to generate in terms of autonomous humanoid robots. We'll, show you some pictures here in a minute, but that's what we're talking about. We don't need to invent anything. Let's just work with others who are doing that. So speaking of that, I want to talk about robotics here just briefly. And you heard about the aerials earlier, and I want to add a couple of examples to that. Um, but you know, you see a couple of illustrations here. Um, that one in the, in the right top corner, that's a humanoid, an autonomous humanoid robot. The hard push. Uh, the DARPA people were pushing on uh, getting, this some, getting something out uh, with those type of robotics was for the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant in Japan from the tsunami disaster, uh, where the whole thing was to have something that could go in there, climb over very harsh debris, and turn valves. And then, you know, hopefully come back out, but if not, so be it. Well, so that was a hard target, and my understanding is that we've been able to meet that. Now, we look at these robotics as sensors, arguably, but they're also performing functions as well. Very interesting. And, you know, aside from the sort of the three primary categories, ground-based or terrestrial, uh, but also um, aerial, the drones and so forth, UAS, UAVs, and submersibles. And I'll tell you right now, submersibles, well, they're already, you know, well advanced. And I'm, I gotta say, if you gotta do you know, under ice rescue and so forth, you really want some of that stuff. I mean, those submersibles are impressive and they're, they're well advanced and they can do great things for you. Now, um, I wanna say there's other very specific narrow robotics going on. I show an example here of just somebody taking off gloves. Well, there's some robot applications that are being developed for the donning and doffing of contaminated gear. It's like, oh. I get it, okay, some specific applications. We don't need a humanoid robot that's gonna come replace us or whatever, but I sure would like to have something help me get off contaminated gear, perhaps. So, you know, these are some of the specific tasks that we can use this kind of thing for. Think outside the box. So, we'll talk a little more about some of the robots and so forth, but just to wrap up this section on the, on the research roadmap, and I, if you saw the online material, there's actually a, a post from last year where I did mention these, these same 10 scenarios. Well, the whole, this all came about because as we worked with the 22 co-authors for the research roadmap, half of them were fire service or emergency response or emergency manager type folks. The other half were these cyber physical systems people. And they were, they were fun to work with because it was so innocent and naive. It's like, well, what do firefighters do other than fight a structural house fire? I say, firefighters do a lot. We do a lot. And so we had to sort of outline that, and we did with these 10 scenarios. Like, look, 
Here's some examples, you know. It's not just a structural resonance, it's also structural high rise. It's, you know, and you can see the list. And we went right down it. But you know, think about any and everything that a firefighter does today, and the intent here is to address all of that. So nobody within this room or the virtual room that's watching or out there as a whole, nobody is left off the table. I mean, this addresses something for everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears here now, and I wanna talk about really what's gonna be a focus for tomorrow, data, data, in a sea of data. And that's a line from Samuel Collard, you know, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Well, I'm telling you, data, data is everywhere, and there's plenty to drink. It's a question of what are you gonna do with it? So, here's this saying, from uh, this individual, Clive Humby of the UK, and there's a lot of credit goes back to him for making this statement in his newsletter back uh, approximately 2006, uh, that data is the new oil. But it's not just the fact that you get this stuff out of the ground and it's a bucket of this crude black oil. No, it's what you do with it. It's what you do with it. And you're gonna hear this over and over again about data and data analytics. Data analytics, is huge, and I'm back to you gather the data, you process the data, and then you deliver the goods at the end of the day. That's what it's all about here. So data is the new oil. So I kept hearing this, and it's like, well, what are we talking about? And you know, here's some examples. You think about what oil does for us today. Pharmaceuticals, um, synthetics, vehicles, uh, other materials that we're able to derive because of what we can do with that oil, allows aviation, uh, we can send a person to the moon and return them safely. I mean, these are some of the technological things that we've been able to do by harvesting that oil. Now, I can tell you the people who first started using whale oil way back in the 1800s, they had no clue of what we were going to do with it. Not a clue whatsoever. But, you know, um, and I borrowed this from my colleague, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Lynn at NFPA, but the, um, you know, the whale oil population it, it, you know, we almost drove them to extinction because it's just like, hey, this, this oil you get out of these whales, you can light, um, you know, these lamp, lamps, lanterns, and you can have artificial light. Wow, this is great stuff. And then things started happening. You know, we found out, hey, we can get this out of the ground, Pennsylvania, uh, elsewhere, Texas, and other parts of the country and around the world. And then we figured out, start, we started to really figure out what to do with this oil or do with the data. So, you know, we're back to the refinement. It's not so much that you have buckets of it around, just like data, it's what you do with it. And I can tell you right now, just like back in the 1800s, they didn't have a clue of the pharmaceuticals and synthetics and all this other stuff, we don't have a clue today on where we're going with the data that we're harvesting. I mean, the potential is incredible. So just like crude oil, it's refined, well, you know, we have data being refined, and it's a data analytics, so I've really got to emphasize, you know, we talk about data analytics. That's not just a secondary term that it's like, what are they talking about? It's doing something with the data, the processing of the data. It's enormous. You know, it's, you know, taking whatever it is and then making something out of it. So that's huge. That's huge. And that is going to change our world. So. You know, data is indeed the new oil. You know, I kept hearing that, and um, I thought there was another slide there, uh, unless I skipped it on, um, I think that came out, okay. The, um, so the, um, I went and I, the slide that's not there, and I just want to mention it, was a slide where I went to the market capitalization, and I pulled it, you can pull it historically, for the top public corporations in 2011 at the end of the year, and six of the top 10 are oil companies. Oil in 2011. Well, I checked it again in March of uh, 2016, and only one was oil. The top four were all the data giants, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Oracle. You know, you go right down the list, and it's like, and they are, they are starting to dwarf everybody else. Data is indeed the new oil. Data is the new oil. So for NFPA, you know, and I'm gonna switch gears slightly here and just talk about uh, the sandbox as we sort of head into the home stretch.
but data and data analytics, NFPA has made the, you know, a, a deep dive into this as becoming, you heard Jim Polly earlier, an information and knowledge organization, fits very well with the DIKY pyramid. But one of the things that happened was to go and, and obtain these servers, uh, which NFPA now has for the storage of data, the crunching of data, the analytics. We've named them Crosby after uh, Everett and Oberto Crosby, two of the four individuals who started NFPA in a little meeting in Boston in 1896. And so just like in the ideas like Watson, you know, with IBM, well, this is Crosby. But here's the real message here. For NFPA, you know, we're seriously into this, and we're in it for the long haul. You know, we really want to go forward as an information and knowledge organization. And so we're really trying to gear up. Oh, well, here is my slide that I thought I skipped. I didn't realize I had it out of order, sorry. But here, we, here you see um, the, you know, six of the top 10 in 2011, and then you can see the uh, companies in 2016. And there's five of the top 10 uh, right up there in, um, in 2016. Data is the new oil. So um, I would just want to close this section and, and wrap it up with the final sections here. But um, just mentioning, you're going to hear more about this tomorrow, national data collection activities. Now, the little diagram, and first of all, there's the data analytics sandbox. And Dr. Nathaniel Lin and his staff, they're here, a number of them. Uh, I know they're ready to answer questions as well. Um, and there's a lot going on with national data collection. The diagram on the right, that blue uh, chart, that's from uh, NFPA 950 on uh, the standard for uh, data exchange for the fire service. And, um, and even now, probably needs to be further updated. But there's a lot going on with data collection. Now, I want to give you these two key observations here. First of all, and, and I'll be one of the first people to say, as we look at NFERS, and you heard this this morning, I mean, there's definitely room for improvement. But I want to tell you, do not throw the baby out with the bathwater in the sense that um, what that has done for us is enormous in terms of policy and so forth. Uh, the fact that we collect data. Now, this is the important part. Don't lose this in the sense that when they say, what's in it for me, but what's in it for we? You've got to think that way. What's in it for we? Because we've collected data through the NFIRST system, we've been able to leverage federal funding. We've been able to do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. I sit on a group uh, for NIOSH, National Occupational um, in National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and they call it NORA. It's the agenda setting group for the public safety sector. It includes law enforcement, and I, I love it when the law enforcement people at the meetings keep saying, we don't have data like you. And I, you know, when I first heard that, it's like, well, what do you mean you don't have data? You have a lot of crime data and so forth. They said, it's crime data, occupational safety and health data. We don't have that. We're envious of you fire service people. You have, you have data that shows injuries and so forth. That's so important. Don't underestimate that. So here we are as we talk about national data sets and, and data collection. We absolutely want to have all this data working together. We want these other data sets, whatever they are, and there's a lot of them out there now that are coming up, um, a lot of activity on this, and I don't want to go too deeply into it, other than to say it's critical going forward that we use all this data uh, for our own good, for the, for the good of the community. And we definitely want to automate this. We, you know, there's no reason. This is another one of those things where the cyber physical systems people say, wait a minute, don't you have computer-aided dispatch? Aren't you just automatically harvesting that and, and watching the real-time information on your handheld device for national fire data? It's like, well, no, we can't do that yet. Um, but that's how they think. They think, it's easy. Come on, let's go. Well, you know, we need to go down that path. So we're, we are heading down that, and, you know, that's the good news piece. So I want to sort of head into the, the home stretch here, and I want to talk about um, these last two sections um, and making a difference. And this is information for you to think about in your breakout groups today. So gathering data, processing the data, and delivering the data. So let's just talk about this in these three slides, and I just want to zoom from close within a firefighter, the onboard stuff, and go outward. So on board, we do see we're already doing a number of great things. Physiological monitoring, um, you know, we're back to GPS locators and so forth. But I, you know, I love this in that, you know, here we are, we, ha we have other issues even with our onboard electronics. Don't give me another thing, the Christmas tree concept. Don't hang another ornament on me. I'm already carrying so much stuff. 
But here's the real message. Why are we carrying seven batteries? You know, what's the deal with that? Why, why isn't there one central po centralized power supply with a backup? We, we know all about supervision and reliability and all that kind of thing. Give it to us. So there are some groups that are working on this, you know, large and small, academia. I'm involved in one project, I mentioned it there, the University of New Mexico, who's trying to create under National Science Foundation funding a cyber firefighter electronic platform for all the onboard electronics. Well, we need this, and we need it to all work together. There's all kinds of other things going on here, um, you know, with f uh, physiological monitoring, the WASP, the phaser, uh, tracking with the Glancer project from DHS. A lot, lot going on. So let me expand out now on the fire ground or the emergency scene itself and, and take that focus, the broader focus. I have to say, you know, first of all, we're sitting here in this room today, standing, sitting. Uh, this is a, there is a wealth of data here. There is a facilities manager somewhere who probably has an iPad or whatever, and he's monitoring the HVAC, the electrical utilities, and you know, location of the elevators, it's all there. It's all there. We want that. So how do we harvest that and get it back to us to use during an emergency, whatever that emergency is, and getting it filtered so we're getting exactly what we need, the way we need it, when we need it, and nothing more. Okay, not that easy. But that's what we want to do. So you, know, you can see some of these uh, illustrations here. There's electric utility, smart grid, you know, a lot going on with smart grid. Um, from the utilities, but um, I show some other robotics, and just to mention those quickly, from um, the LC3, uh, which are, you know, the blue ox that carry payloads um, that can climb up mountains and so forth, or uh, another one, the bug bot, size of a little mosquito, and we talk about, uh, you know, we talked about drones earlier. I mean, I love some of the uh, applications that uh, we're starting to see beyond even the ones that you mentioned, John. Um, in terms of, it's not just surveillance going on. It, you know, you talked about payloads, but there's defibrillator um, delivery or other, you know, supplies you mentioned on the water, for instance, uh, for a flotation device. Um, one of the ones that I found, well, two that I found particularly novel uh, is the swarming for indoor use, whether they're small, disposable, like the bug bots, but, you know, something that goes in and can release things and you can track what's going on. You know, okay, we don't have the sensors in the building, send them in some kind of disposable thing, you know, that lets all sorts of sensors go that float out and you can track what's going on ventilation-wise and so forth. Uh, but then there is um, another, and, and swarming technology for indoor use. So just keep your eyes on that. There's groups looking at it. But another one, when we went over to the Middle East this summer and they're having some problems with um, fires in taller buildings, but another novel approach is to take something with a lot of thrust, you know, maybe the jet pack or whatever it is, um, but elevating a hose line up. So the water tower from the 1800s of the future today, so you get this thing up to the 70th floor or whatever, so you can have an exterior hose line up high. I thought that was very novel, and you know, and trying to account for the back pressure of the hose line and so forth. So that's another application that, I, you know, really dazzled me. So anyway, and then finally, I do want to talk about um, the, um, jurisdiction and sort of the broader, and you're going to hear tomorrow from Chief Johnson uh, and Jeff Johnson who, you know, works very closely with FirstNet, and you're going to hear his um, discussion, but, you know, we talk about technology and, you know, there's hardware, there's software, but if you don't have the communications, you don't have the pipeline to get all this stuff wherever it needs to go, everything's dead in the water. You got to have that, and, you know, FirstNet is hugely important. The whole D-block thing, it's hugely important huge. And, you know, again, I'm confident we feel like we're heading in the right direction with all this. This is all great stuff. So, you know, and I show there's a little symbol in the left-hand corner. That's from our research roadmap showing, look, you know, we have four primary orbits that we're looking at in terms of the communications. We're looking at the communications on board a firefighter to start with, that inner circle. Then as you expand that, it's the team or the unit, perhaps on the fire ground, then you expand that to that third circle, and it's the fire ground itself. Then you expand it to the broader circle, it's the interjurisdictional activity going on. They're all important, and it's all got to work. And it's got to work seamlessly, it's got to be resilient, it's got to be there when everything else fails. It's got to work, and it's hugely important. Now, before I go on, I just have to mention Vost. You, we heard a little bit about this. Um, 
with the presentation on the civil unrest, but you know, the social media here, social media is not simply an outgoing outreach kind of thing. And VOS, Virtual Operations Support Teams, and there's a group, the Virtual Operations Support Group, and you can go to their website, and there's incredible things going out with groups harvesting social media. Back to Fort McMurray, I mentioned it uh, briefly at the beginning, and Fort McMurray, they were doing this, and they were, you know, there was a lot of complicated things. They evacuated people and had to reevacuate them again, you know, several times over. Well, they were going on social media, and they had their support team. I'm not even sure where they're located. They could be in another country. They don't need to be there. And they have a filter, and the incident command se system is set up. And you have a team of people, and they're going through all the social media. Get us some video or real-time pictures of what's going on in this neighborhood. Well, they just go out and they do geofencing and they're harvesting that. Here you go. And you're getting real-time data for real-time events. This is going on. I know a number of you are already familiar with it, but I know a number of people are not. And this is a big deal. And it's, you know, another use of social media. That's incredible. And I just want to, you know, mention quickly, I saw two clear examples. I was at the Esri User Conference last year, Henrico County, Virginia. They showed an example uh, where they... Um, they had at the Richmond 500 NASCAR race, there was a report came in of a guy climbing up over the fence onto the track, a drunk guy, and they didn't have video cameras down there, so they immediately did a geofence, just like being up on the stage, you know, and they, and they said, let's capture all the social media. There he is, he's dungarees, white t-shirt, back with baseball, he's halfway up the fence, they swoop in, they catch the guy, okay? And while I was in that presentation, some of the firefighters from Pasadena said, yeah, well, we're doing the same thing with the Rose Bowl parade. We geofence at the front of the parade to see what's going on as it's moving down the street. So everybody in the world, they want to use social media. Guess what they do? They check the little box to sign away. Yeah, sure, I don't care. You know, just take my data. <laughs> it's there. So, okay, that's both. Now, just uh, to wrap up here, we are at the home stretch. Uh, these are some things I want you to think about as you're in your break breakout groups here, as we talk about the future. Just in terms of technology development, we don't need to invent anything new. You heard me say that earlier. You're going to hear the following speaker. He's going to give you some great examples, whether it's large corporations, small entrepreneurs, universities. There is incredible stuff going on there. We want us to all be in the same parade. So we don't need to invent anything new. The other thing, though, here is it's not necessarily technology development that's our barrier. It's the non-technical issues. What am I talking about? Well, let me give you an example. Physiological monitoring, well, that's great. We can measure heartbeat and, you know, what's going on physically with the person on the fire ground. What do we do with that data? What do we do? Do we have a red light, yellow light, green light? Okay, that's a good idea. What is a threshold for everybody? What do we do if you have a yellow light or a red light? Do we take you off and give you a desk job? Oh, wait a minute. Okay, this is getting complicated. You know, those non-technical implications are enormous. We're back to all of you. Your voice is critical at solving lots of those non-technical issues. We can't do this alone. We all have to work together. So, um, standardization, a couple of key observations here. The pace of technology is leapfrogging well ahead of our infrastructure to support it. It's, I'm sure, obvious to a lot of you. We cannot keep up, but we need to do our best. But the other thing I'll say on that is we don't want to slow it down. It, we got to work hard to just keep this going uh, because it's all good. And I mentioned some of the standards here, NFPA 950, 951. I want to um, actually jump to this next slide um, in terms of still standardization. But we also need to be watching for other game-changing activities out there and other players. And in this case, I just show this other simple document. Uh, it's an ISO document, um, ISO, not the insurance uh, rating group, but the ISO that developed standards in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, um, and the sustainable development of communities, ISO 37120. Well, chapter 10 of this document is arguably fire service deployment, kind of, you know, how to match the numbers up. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, so we're involved with this NFPA, uh, we're the technical administrator group for this activity for the U.S. Uh, as we try to stay on top of this. It's like, where did this come from? Well, you know, this is important. And we're going to keep an eye on it because it's going to allow cities everywhere in the world to just freely and easily compare their data. 
And then finally, I just want to wrap up with training and indicate um, uh, don't underestimate the importance of how we use this stuff because quite honestly, we talk about the infrastructure not being here to support it. Uh, we don't have that, and that includes training or the operational know-how, the pro qual, you name it. We've got to develop all that. And I've also got to say there's incredible things going on that we simply need to piggyback on, like the gaming industry and so forth. So um, with that, um, I'm back to this final summary slide of the DIKY pyramid. Whatever it is we're talking about, you know, this comes back, and this can serve us. So don't underestimate the value of data. And, you know, I said uh, in the beginning, I have a vision, and the vision is tomorrow, but tomorrow is today. And, you know, quite honestly, that's where I see us right now. Um, there's so much happening. I'm very optimistic for the future, but there's a lot of changes on the horizon. So, you know, hold on to your socks and, you know, and think outside the box and, and uh, but, you know, think about what we can do to make our world a better place. Thank you very much. So I, I look, Ken, I don't know if we want to take questions or two questions. Okay, so, and there's bright lights up here, so we'll just have to. Oh, yes. Uh, my question has to do with scaling this. We, we have about 30,000 fire departments in the United States. 10,000 of them are in communities of under three or 4,000 people. And as a chief of one of those departments, I love the data and I love using it, but one of the problems that I have is I don't have big data. I have individual events on an annual or biannual way, and it makes it difficult for us to use analytics to justify what we're doing and how we're working. So how do we scale this down into the small organizations? You know, we, we get one fire a year. W you know, we get 27 motor vehicle accidents. That's not big. And so everything feels like an outlier to us. How do we, how do we cope with yeah, that? Yeah, so the question is on scalability of the data and for uh, communities that are different, whether large or small or whatever the the demographics might be, but I will immediately respond back and say, oh no, you do have data, you have big data. And for instance, you know, I'll just simply say, when we talk about national fire data, you know, a lot of this already exists. And, and some of the groups, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, some of the earlier activities, and looking at you, you, Laurie, I mean, with fire cares and so forth, we're simply harvesting existing data. And I can tell you, you know, I keep a real estate app on my phone and I could go to, I could find out your home address for anybody here. I could immediately go and look up a lot of data, like when you bought and sold your home, when it was, the, what the tax record is going way back, what the education deal is with the schools nearby. Where did they get all that data? It's already there. They're just simply cross-pollinating it. So I got to say, you know, I, you know, the scalability thing in many cases just goes away in that the data is already there and it's ubiquitous in that sense. So, you know, I, Scalability is always a question, but I, I don't feel it's, a, it's as much a barrier as it might seem. Uh, one more question? Yeah, I was trying to, um, I'm with the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, and um, from an instructor standpoint, um, you know, this is pretty broad, but we're, one of the things we were thinking about too is how if you were um, like at a training academy type of um, inf you know, data collection, how could the um, data be used in a controlled environment such as recruit training drills, and um, you know, what kind of information could be gathered, and how can an instructor use it for um, real-time feedback for the students, you know, before we even get out into the world? <laughs> how can we, you know, start here? Yeah, so it's the, the use of data in training and, and uh, similar activities, and if I understand correctly, and, and I, you know, training, it's a, it's a repetitious activity in a sense, so it's, you know, it brings that along. That's a, you know, a, definitely a benefit and a gift. But I, I'll also say, you know, we, we like to engage in realistic training, of course, but that means we're often, you know, sort of on the cutting edge of danger, perhaps, and other issues. And, you know, so how do we use this to our ability? Well, I'm back to, you know, thinking, you know, in terms of 
and I, I can't say specifically um, in terms of the data, but we want to recreate that experience as realistically as possible. And again, you know, on gaming and other things that are going on, some of this is incredible. Um, we want to harvest data where it is available. Some of it is straightforward. We're working on a project right now at the University of Arizona uh, in terms of harvesting the black box data, working closely with the fire departments, the unions, and others because we realize, well, wait a minute. You know, so you harvest that black box data for the fire apparatus and for the, for the driver. What does that mean in terms of driver training? Well, that's valuable information, but it's also got other implications. And so we're you know, carefully going through that. But it's so you know, how do we bring this to bear to make it better and the training experience better and safer? So, so you know, again, I'm optimistic that we're heading down a path where we can, you know, every time you turn around, there's something new that somebody comes up with. So, um, okay, so back to you, Ken. Thank you, Casey, and I have one question that we received online, and I'd like to uh, summarize it, Casey, and see if you could respond, and it's asking, what's NFPA going to do in looking at the information insurance needs as you look at very many data sets, including that may be coming from the military and other uh, agencies with high national security interests? So any uh, response to that, Casey? Yes, um, so uh, clearly, the, and I'm back to the, the non-technical implications of the data and the oil, if you will, in that analogy, in handling all that safely. And, I, and you know, oil is actually a great analogy here because, you know, and uh, Greg Knoll is going to speak uh, tonight, but we just came off the, uh, you know, the Hazmat Incident Command workshop, Fred and others who were at that. But, you know, uh, clearly the safe handling of the data is critical. And you know, I know Dr. Nathaniel Lin and his team, this is a key part of what they're working on uh, with the Data uh, Solution Center and the Data Analytics Sandbox. It's, a, it's right up there at the top, uh, and you're shaking your head yes, um, in terms of the critical things. And I've got to say, you, know, you, you cannot be collecting data without you know, working through all the issues related to privacy, competitive marketplace, um, you know, whatever, the, the purity of the data, um, all these issues, and you know, you've got to make sure that it's safe. And you know, I'm one of those people who's had my, I've had my credit card replaced several times because of you know, large groups that have you know, been hacked or whatever. Well, that's enormously important. Um, and so that is being directly addressed, addressed by uh, Dr. Nathaniel Lin and his, his team at NFPA. Okay, with that, they're telling me that there's gonna be a trap door opening up here somewhere or something, so I think we're all set. Thank you again.